we're going to talk about does the church replace Israel? The quick answer is no. And in this study, I'm going to show you how the church actually doesn't replace Israel. And I'm also going to show you how to have a balanced view on Israel. Some take it too far one way. Some take it too far the other way. Many errantly teach that all Jews are saved, even if they reject Jesus Christ, simply because they are a Jew. And that's a lie. Some teach that God is so done with Israel that the church replaces them. And that's a lie. They usually end up being very anti-Semitic. And I'd also like to say I don't worship the Jews. I don't sit around thinking about the Jews. And they are wicked people. The Jews are involved in some bad things. They're heavy, heavily involved in Hollywood and the porn industry. And I've heard you can't even pass out a tract in Israel. But this is besides the point. It seems like if you don't teach replacement theology then many have the idea that you are obsessed with the Jews and that you think they get a free pass into heaven. I honestly don't know any Bible teacher who teaches this with exception of some fake preachers on TV. But the Christians should recognize that the Jews are beloved enemies. They are enemies to the gospel, but they are beloved for the Father's sake. But... Now let's look at what is the church. People say the church replaces Israel, but let's look at what the church is. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, it says, And put, hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of, fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know it isn't referring to a building because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth as it says in 1 Timothy 3.15. And the Bible talks about three different kinds of people. It talks about the church, the Jew, and the Gentile. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10.32, it says, Give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. So the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. And any unsaved Jews and Gentiles, which aren't in the body of Christ, will go to hell when they die. You get in the body of Christ by accepting the free payment for sin. Jesus Christ died. He died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. That's the gospel. And you get in Jesus Christ by believing that gospel. Jews and Gentiles both have to come to this gospel to be saved and then they are put into the church of God. And that's the three classes of people, the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. By placing your faith in what Jesus did then to pay payment for your sin, you can be saved and have eternal life. You have to believe the gospel, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Any Jew or Gentile who rejects this truth of their own free will, they will go to hell for all eternity. And knowing that there are three classes of people, the Jew, Gentile, and church, we can look at Galatians 3.28, which says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So the moment a person gets in Christ in the spiritual sense, Notice I said in the spiritual sense, they lose their national distinction. When a Jew gets saved, he is spiritually no longer a Jew. The same goes for a Gentile. However, does that take away their physical? Does that make them not a Jew or a Gentile anymore physically? Notice the verse also said there is neither male nor female. I treat it again, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, okay? When you get in Christ, you spiritually are no longer Jew nor Greek. You're spiritually no longer male or female.
but physically, when I got saved, I'm still a male. I didn't become neither. And this is what the transgender people or whatever it is, they'll, use, they'll take this verse and say, well, I'm saved, I'm no longer male or female, and you know, who knows what they are. But if but you don't want to use that verse like them. You don't want to say, well, I'm no, there's no longer Jew nor Gentile when we're in Christ. But you got to remember, you're still physically one or the other, just like you're still physically male or female. So this is referring to the spiritual sense, because although you are saved, you could still see your physical features. You need to realize you are still male or female. Physically, you're still a Jew or a Gentile. Keeping this in mind brings us to our first point. The church doesn't replace Israel because we see a Jewish body of believers in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 7, 4, it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. If this is the same class of people as the church of God, then why is it referring to them as the children of Israel? Why are they sealed in their foreheads when the church is sealed unto the day of redemption? As it says in Ephesians 4.30 and Ephesians 1.13, obviously, this is a different group of believers entirely. This is because during the time of Jacob's trouble, the church has already left in a rapture. And saved people aren't being put in the body of Christ. The body of Christ went up at the rapture. The church obviously doesn't replace Israel if God is once again going to deal with them in the future as he did in the Old Testament. And that's why what we call the tribulation, the title is the time of Jacob's trouble. Some will make the 144,000 out to be the Old Testament saints who come back. I mean, that's okay if you want to believe that, but I believe it's literal Jews there that are living during that time. And either way, you still have God dealing with children of Israel who are sealed in their foreheads, obviously different than the body of Christ, making the 144,000 out to, out to be Resurrected Old Testament saints is done by many, not everybody who believes this, but many do this in an effort to get rid of the Jew completely because the ones who teach this usually believe that there aren't any Jews, real Jews left. They think so much mixing was done that there really is no longer any Jews. Uh, next, I believe the church hasn't replaced Israel because Paul calls Israel enemies of the gospel. When you are born again, you are no longer the enemy of God. The church isn't God's enemy. You are a son of God. Ephesians 2.16 says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The church is, is supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. We aren't to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, we are supposed to keep it in memory, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Yet Paul talks about Israel and says they are enemies of the gospel. In Romans 11:25 through 28, it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now think about this. If this is Christians, then why are they beloved for the Father's sake. Fathers, not as in God the Father, but fathers, as in the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look how that's written. It's not fathers like God the Father. 
It's the fathers. They are beloved for the father's sakes. I'm beloved because I believe the gospel. So when it comes to the gospel, the Jews are our enemies. Jews reject the Lord Jesus Christ and most of them are wicked Christ rejectors. And as a nation, they are blinded in part. Notice, in part to the gospel. And some Jews still believe the gospel and get saved, but most Jews are lost and on their way to hell because they reject the gospel. They're not just going to go to heaven because they're Jews. And nobody that I know of that's even relevant is teaching that. So if the church replaced Israel, then how is the church called an enemy of the gospel? In Romans 11. How is a born again believer an enemy of the gospel? How are we enemies of the gospel? Tell me that if the church replaced Israel. And next I'd like to point out that Paul lets us know that all of Israel isn't saved. Is all of the church saved? If you're really a born again believer in the church, are you not really saved? Romans eleven twenty six says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. You're going to have to really twist this verse or think of something to make Israel the church. Because it says, And so all Israel shall be saved. I'm already saved. If you're a Bible believer, and you're born again, then you realize you're already saved. If you believe the Bible, you can see clear verses that teach each born-again believer presently has salvation and is sitting in heavenly places in Christ. It isn't that we shall be saved or are being saved as the new versions teach. We are saved and secure. And Paul says, and so all Israel shall be saved, showing that the church is not Israel. Next, I'd like to point out that in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Jew will be worshiping in a temple. Temple worship comes back. Re Revelation 11, 1 and 2 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread under foot forty and two months. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there is going to be a temple and sacrifices. This goes contrary to the church because we don't have a building for a temple. The temple is our body. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? The Antichrist will stand in the temple claiming to be God. We won't have to worry about this because the body of Christ will be gone in a rapture. We ain't going to be here to see this. We're going out in a rapture. We're not going to see the events of the time of Jacob's trouble because it's not the church's trouble. Next, I'd like to point out another difference between the church and Israel. Israel has a covenant land grant. The church doesn't. We don't get new, we get we get New Jerusalem. They get the land that was promised. Psalms one hundred five, eight through twelve says, "He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac, and he and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel." For an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, Will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance? When they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it. It's an everlasting covenant. That means it never goes away. After the time of Jacob's trouble in the millennium, Israel will get the land, and saints who are in the church age will get to reign over cities. And in eternity, we will be in New Jerusalem. So, the church doesn't have the covenant land grant. Israel does. I'd also like to point out that the new covenant. What about the new covenant? When we got saved, we got in on this new covenant. 
we are presently saved right now. But Israel as a nation hasn't got in on the new covenant yet. Hebrews 8.10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. The new covenant can be a tad confusing because it has a dual nature. But when we get in on the new covenant, we've done this by believing the gospel. And Israel as a nation gets in on it later. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And see, that's another thing there. If we're, we are Israel, then who's Judah? If the church is Israel, then who is Judah? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. You see, when they get in on that new covenant, and the millennium starts, people aren't going to be prophesying in the millennium. They're not going to be. Uh, people aren't going to be coming up to each other soul winning during this time. Everyone's going to know the Lord. You're either going to accept Him or reject Him. Sure, there's going to be unbelievers there, but you're not going to have to come up to somebody and say, "Do you know Jesus?" Will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And that shows that Israel is not the church. That's not happening right now. Uh, we go to people and we say, Do you know who Jesus is? Will you believe the gospel? But in Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-four, it says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. This is obviously referring to the millennial kingdom because it says that. And this is a time when everyone will be able to see Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. And that's when Israel gets in on the new covenant as a nation. In Jeremiah 30 verses 7 through 11 it says, Alas, for that day is great. So that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore, Fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee. Yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So it's the time of Jacob's trouble. If the church replaced Israel, then why wouldn't it be called the time of the church's trouble and let's just go right on through it? The church doesn't replace Israel because they will once again be under the law. As you know, as Christians who are in the body of Christ, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. And obviously we still go by the commands in the Old Testament, such as thou shalt not kill, steal, or commit adultery. But we don't have to keep the Sabbath. We aren't under the law, we are under grace. And I don't believe anyone was saved by keeping the law. You're not saved, you can't get justified by keeping the law, that's not what I'm saying. But they are once again, once again going to be under the law in the time of Jacob's trouble. It says in 
Exodus thirty one thirteen, speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath she shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So the Sabbath was a sign between Israel and God. It has nothing to do with the church. So Israel will keep the Sabbath during the time of Jacob's trouble because in Colossians two sixteen and 17 it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ. So if the Sabbath is not for the church and it's a sign between God and Israel and it's coming back again that shows that God's not done with Israel and that shows that the church is in Israel. In Matthew 24, when Jesus describes the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of the end of the world, he says this in Matthew 24:20, 20, but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. I'm a Christian. I don't have to worry about the Sabbath day. I can mow my yard on the Sabbath day if I want. This is in the future and Israel will, will be keeping the Sabbath. Replacement theology, theology teachers who replace Israel with the church are in a hurry to do so because they want to put the church through the tribulation. And Matthew 24 is their favorite chapter. But obviously there isn't a born-again Christian in the body of Christ anywhere in the chapter. Remembering that Israel was under the law and will be under the law again in the future reveals a difference between Israel and the church and shows the church doesn't replace Israel. No one was ever saved by keeping the law. They kept in the Old Testament, they kept the law. When they broke it, they offered the prescribed sacrifice. And then after that, they were once again made according to the law blameless. And that mixed with their faith got them into Abraham's bosom or paradise. But once Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, the blood was applied, they were then allowed to go up to the third heaven. No one ever got to the third heaven by keeping the law or by their works. They got That's how they got to paradise. So technically they weren't saved by keeping the law, but they were under the law. They had to keep it, and if they didn't, then there was consequences. Another thing to realize is if people in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the cross, then why was the law implemented to begin with? The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. But if people were saved by looking forward to the cross, then why didn't things just work like they do now? Why the sacrifices and temple worship? The church doesn't replace Israel because Paul himself makes a distinction between the church and Israel. In Romans 11, 1 through 3, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What know ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Although Paul is in the body of Christ and in the spiritual sense is no longer Jew or Gentile, he still claims to physically be of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. The church isn't Israel because the church doesn't get the signs. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, The Jews require a sign. And God gave Moses sign gifts to show the children of Israel to prove he was a man of God. And Jesus Christ gave the apostles sign gifts like tongues and healing, casting out devils. As I said earlier, the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. John twenty twenty nine. Jesus says unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas had to feel Jesus' hands inside before he would believe. He needed a sign. We are those that have not seen and yet have believed. 
in the time of Jacob's trouble, these signs come back because God will once again be dealing with Israel. And that is why you see all the supernatural things happening. Did you ever wonder why all this supernatural stuff happened in the Old Testament that you could see with your eyes? And in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, which is the, a transitional book that transitions from the Jews into the church. And now in this time we are in, you don't see that much supernatural things happening like it did in the Old Testament. Then you read in Revelation where all these wild things begin to happen again. And that is because the church is gone. The signs come back because the Jews require a sign. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. So Romans eleven twenty five through 29 shows good enough proof that Israel and the church aren't the same thing. God's not done with Israel. That's why the signs come back in the time of Jacob's trouble after the church has been removed. Romans eleven twenty five. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. If blindness has happened to Israel, is the church blind? If you are claiming to be Israel in verse 25, then you're saying the church is blind. We're not blind when it comes to the gospel. That right there alone proves the church didn't replace Israel. We're not blind in part. Israel is. Romans eleven twenty six says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So if all Israel shall be saved, then that means that the church isn't presently saved. If the church replaced Israel. Are we waiting to be saved or are we presently saved? I'm presently saved. Romans 11.27 says, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Does Israel replace the church? Or is God not done with Israel? And this is talking about Israel. Our sins are already taken away. I'm not waiting on him to take away my sins. They're already gone. Romans 11.28 As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. The church isn't an enemy to the gospel, but Israel is. Although they are enemies, we love them for the Father's sake. The fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, the balanced view on how to look at the Jews is beloved enemies. They are enemies when it comes to the gospel, but they're beloved for the Father's sakes. Romans eleven twenty nine for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God promised to Abraham, and he is going to fulfill that promise. That covenant will take full effect in the millennium. The replacement theology crowd may also take you to Romans 9, 6, which says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. There are two different Jews referred to here. One is a physical Jew that is a spiritual Jew because he believed the gospel. And the other is a physical Jew that rejects the gospel. He is dead in trespasses and sins and on his way to hell. No Jew is getting a free pass into heaven just because he's a Jew. And I don't know whether they're getting that we believe that. But they got to come to the gospel just like us. But most of them aren't because most Jews are blind to the gospel. Most Jews are enemies concerning the gospel, but the church is an enemy of the gospel. The church isn't blind in part. You see, there's so many differences between the Jew, the nation of Israel, and the church. But I hope this is giving you a better understanding of what replacement theology is. And I hope you can see that it's not biblical. And if you believe in replacement theology, you may be King James only. But you're not a Bible believer. You do not believe the Bible. 
And I just showed you how you do not believe the Bible. You're having to look over stuff, change stuff, make it say something it doesn't say. And you basically are rejecting huge portions of the Old Testament if you are teaching replacement theology. You are not a King James Bible believer, even if you use the King James, because you are just denying what the Bible says. But this has been the church does not replace Israel.